Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. So today we'll be continuing the hemodynamic series on constrictive pericarditis. In the first part of this video, I had talked about the two most important aspects of constriction. Number one, dissociation of the intrapericardial and intraventricular pressures. And number two, evidence of ventricular interdependence. So today we'll be talking about what changes in pressure occur during the diastolic phase in cases of constrictive pericarditis. So when we mind map, we are under hemodynamics. We're talking about the pericardium and we're going to be talking about these four questions. Go through them for your active recall. What diastolic pressure findings are seen in constrictive pericarditis? Now these are the three cardinal findings that we see. Number one, equalization and increase of all the diastolic pressures and they become equal to the pressure of the stretched pericardium. Second, a high mean right atrial pressure with deep atrial Y and X descents. And third, a ventricular dip and plateau pattern which is seen in diastole. So what do these three pressure characteristics in diastole mean? Let's start by understanding them one by one. First, let's begin with this particular point, which is equalization and increase of all diastolic pressures. Now, because of this shell of pericardium, which is thickened, it becomes a constricting shell around all these cardiac chambers, so much so that it leads to the equalization of the pressures within the heart. This is sort of akin to Midas touch, wherein anything the pericardium constricts or touches, it changes its pressure to its own pressure. So the pressures in diastole of all these chambers become equal to the pressure in the pericardium. So the right atrial mean pressure is the same as the right ventricular end diastolic pressure is the same as the pulmonary arterial diastolic pressure which is equal to the mean pressure of the left atrium or in some cases you can say the mean pressure of the wedge pressure if you're calculating the wedge pressure which is equal to the end diastolic pressure of the left ventricle. Now let's see what happens to the atrial and ventricular pressure tracings during diastole. Now this is an illustration wherein I'm showing a green waveform which represents the right atrial pressure tracing and a black waveform which represents the left ventricular pressure tracing. Now this can be interchanged with its corresponding ventricle also. I mean I can represent LV as RV or RV as LV and similarly a right atrial pressure tracing can be interchanged with a left atrial pressure tracing. But for, for the purpose of example, I have shown this particular tracings and I have overlapped them so that they correspond to each other systole and diastolic phases. Now, what are the waveforms in the right atrial pressure tracing? We have the A, X, V and Y waveforms. So in short, the A wave represents an end diastolic event, which is the atrial kick, which occurs just before the systole. Then there is a systolic phase which represents uh, the time during which there is ventricular systole and there is bringing down of the respective annulus of the atrioventricular valves towards the apex. So because that annulus goes down, the pressure within the atrium above becomes negative during this ventricular systole, the atria is undergoing a diastolic phase. So there's an initial pressure drop during this ventricular systolic phase and that is represented by the X wave in the atrium. After which, venous return starts coming into that atrium during this systole and that leads to a V wave which represents initial venous return. So the X wave or the negative X wave and the early part of V wave or the upstroke of the V wave represent the ventricular systolic phase. This is when the ventricular pressures rise. 
After the V wave, we have a beginning of the diastolic phase. And in this diastolic phase, there is a Y wave in which there is a filling of the ventricle from the atria because now the respective atrioventricular valves have now opened. So you get a drop in the atrial pressure, which is known as the Y wave. So at, again, at the end of the diastole, we get an A wave, which represents the atrial kick. Now let's see what happens in constriction. Now constriction has a high mean right atrial pressure, which we know because of this constricting shell, all the diastolic pressures have risen, which includes a right atrial mean pressure. And this is important clinically because of a raised jugular venous pressure. Now its pressure tracing consists of a deep atrial Y and X descent. The reason why I have mentioned the Y waveform first is because this is an important characteristic feature of constrictive pericarditis that is having a deep Y descent. This is in contrast to cardiac tamponade which does not have a Y descent. So now let's just explain the X descent first. Now we already know that the X descent is the negative pressure waveform which is set in the atria during ventricular systole and atrial diastole and during which the annulus descends towards the apex. Now because of this shell of constriction in constrictive pericarditis, this negative pressure in the RA doesn't last very long. And why is that? Because of this constriction, the right atrium or the left atrium cannot expand easily, cannot relax easily during its diastolic phase. As a result, because of this pressure, it snaps back to its high baseline pressure. Hence, the X waveform or the X descent that we see is deep and sharp. It is present, but it is only present for a short time and it comes back to its high normal very quickly because of this constricting shell. Now, a similar event occurs during diastole. The Y descent or the Y negative waveform occurs because of the filling of the ventricle from the atrium. So it's a diastolic event. Again, because of this constricting shell of pericardium, it doesn't allow the ventricle to receive all the blood throughout the diastole. And because it acts as this constricting shell, there is a sharp Y wave in which most of the filling occurs in the early part of diastole. So it is deep, sharp, it occurs quickly and then the pressures in all the chambers equalize and become equal to that of the high pericardial pressure which is to say that this Y wave snaps back to the high baseline mean pressure of the right atrial mean pressure. And going by the same understanding, this is what happens to the diastolic waveform of the ventricle as well. Here you can see this black line in which initially the ventricle is relaxed. So it goes into this negative dip in which it allows blood to come in it during the early part of diastole. But once the pericardium is stretched to an extent that it cannot stretch anymore, the pressure suddenly rise and equalize to a high baseline, which is the high diastolic pressures. So this is called as a dip and plateau phenomenon, which is characteristically seen in constriction, although there are other causes, but this is seen very much so in constrictive pericarditis. So another way of looking at these deep atrial X and Y descents is to say that the compliance of the corresponding chambers is low. Now there is low compliance of the atrium. As a result, you get a deep sharp X wave which immediately snaps back to the high pressure. And because the compliance in the ventricle is also low, it again has a deep sharp Y wave which again snaps back immediately to its high pressure. So that leads to something like a W trace or a W pattern in the atrial pressure tracing. So the next question is, can similar diastolic events be seen in causes other than constrictive pericarditis? So these three events that we just saw, whether they can be seen in any other conditions. 
Number one is restrictive cardiomyopathy. What happens in restriction is that there is poor compliance of the left ventricle and right ventricle because it's primarily a myocardial disease. It also is associated with functional regurgitation of the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve and it has associated dilated atria. So how does this myocardial disease lead to these diastolic events which are seen characteristically in constrictive pericarditis? Essentially, a stiff non-compliant myocardium starts acting as a shell. It behaves like a shell of constriction. Hence, it can demonstrate all these three events. It can demonstrate elevated diastolic pressures. It can demonstrate a ventricular dip and plateau pattern. And it can demonstrate a high RA pressure with deep atrial X and Y descents because we know that these descents simply mean a loss of compliance of the atria and ventricles. Now note that there are elevated diastolic pressures, but there is no equalization of the diastolic pressure. That is a characteristic feature seen only in constriction. So apart from the equalization part, the rest of the events are seen similarly in restrictive cardiomyopathy as well. There are other causes also. Any decompensated LV or RV failure can also lead to these three events. So the reason is again the same. You have dilated ventricles when you have systolic failure of LV or RV. There is again reduced compliance associated with it. And the pericardium, which is normal, gets stretched by this dilated ventricle. And it again starts acting like a constricting shell. Another reason wherein you get these three vents is severe acute ventricular failure, especially with what we see with right ventricle uh, in, uh, in conditions of acute severe pulmonary embolism. That is a characteristic uh, example which can be associated with acute severe TR or any other cause of acute severe TR or acute se severe aortic regurgitation. All these three can also demonstrate these three findings. The important point is acute and severe. These are the conditions which can lead to the three characteristic findings. But also to note, you can also get additional equalization of the diastolic pressures, especially the RV and the LV and diastolic pressure in such a condition, especially acute severe ventricular failure of the right ventricle. What is the relationship of the right ventricular end diastolic pressure and left ventricular end diastolic pressure in constrictive pericarditis? Now the answer is obvious, they equalize, but I'd like to talk a little further because we've already spoken a bit about how acute severe right ventricular pressure or acute TR or acute AR can also lead to equalization of these diastolic pressures and then it becomes a conundrum to try and differentiate the two causes. Now, now, in constriction, the RVEDP and LVDP equalize in inspiration. On expiration, the left-sided flow increases because a pressure gradient is now set in place on the left side, as we've seen in the first part of this video series. And because of increased blood flow, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, in fact, becomes greater than the right ventricular end diastolic pressure, but it is not more than 5 millimeter mercury difference. So essentially there is equalization except that on expiration there's a little separation but not too much. In restrictive cardiomyopathy or any decompensated ventricular failure there is no equalization so there's no, uh, no confusion there. The left ventricular end diastolic pressure is usually greater than the RVDP by more than 5 millimeters of mercury. Now, the confusing part is when you have acute severe RV failure. In this condition too, you get equalization of the RVDP and LVDP. However, there is equalization of these two end diastolic pressures in expiration, but in inspiration, the RVDP dominates and it becomes greater than LVDP.
so with inspiration you get a separation of these two diastolic curves so this is how you differentiate between constriction and acute severe rv failure in constriction the rv dp never becomes greater than the lv dp at best it equalizes in inspiration both of them equalize in inspiration and on expiration as usual the left ventricular end diastolic pressure becomes greater than the right ventricular end diastolic pressure but not more than 5 however in acute severe rv failure because the rv is so dysfunctional on inspiration its end diastolic pressure rises even further with increased venous return that is when the rv dp separates from the lv dp pressure wave form and that's how we know that the cause is not constriction it is in fact a severe rv failure now this is a pretty busy chart i know but bear with me because it will help summarize all that we've learned so far and help distill the most important points which are required to diagnose different conditions so how do you compare the various pressures seen in constriction versus restrictive ca restrictive cardiomyopathy or decompensated heart failure versus acute severe rv failure or acute severe tricuspid regurgitation So here we have these three conditions. So obviously with all the three conditions you can have a high RA pressure with an X and Y pattern which we've seen that is deep X and Y pattern which is present in all three. Now how do you compare the left sided and the right sided mean pressures that is RA mean and wedge mean pressures since LA mean is not clinically always calculated it's not easy to calculate so as a surrogate you take a wedge pressure tracing now in constriction especially on inspiration both of them are equalized obviously because of the constricting shell you have equalization of the ra and wedge pressures in restrictive or decompensated heart failure the left sided pressures are always going to dominate so the wedge is going to be greater than the ra mean pressure now in acute severe rv failure it's all about the right side hence the ra pressure is in fact going to be greater than the wedge pressure and this is more so on inspiration so on inspiration at best constriction can lead to equalization of the wedge and ra pressure but rv failure can lead to rise in the ra mean above that of the wedge mean pressure then we come to the second point which is raised diastolic pressures which is seen in all the three cases second is the ventricular dip and pattern uh, dip and plateau pattern which is again seen in all the three cases so this is a no brainer then we come to certain points like equalization of rv dp and lv dp which we've just seen in the previous section in constriction they do equalize in inspiration but in expiration the left sided pressures dominate but not more than 5 mm of mercury difference in restriction there is no equalization and always the left sided pressures are greater than the right sided diastolic pressures by more than 5 and in acute severe rv failure they do equalize in expiration and in inspiration the right sided pressures dominate over the left ventricular end diastolic pressure so with inspiration at best constriction leads to the equalization of the rv dp and lv dp but in inspiration in rv failure the rv dp goes up and above the lv dp what about the relationship between right ventricular end diastolic pressure and the right ventricular systolic pressure now in constriction and in rv failure RV DP can be more than one third of the RV SP because we know that the diastolic pressures do rise in both the cases. However, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, since it's predominantly a left-sided event which leads to secondary pulmonary hypertension, it does not lead to such a case. So the RV DP is less than one third of RV SP even if pulmonary hypertension has been set in. what about a systolic pa pressure of more than 55 so this is characteristically seen 
in restriction and hence it will have a high pa pressure in constriction it is never present and it may be present in acute severe rv failure because let's say for example there is a pulmonary embolus it can rise the pa pressure associated with it so then we come to these last two factors what about the wedge and lv gradient and its relationship does the wedge upon lv gradient vary with respiration by more than 5 mm of mercury this happens in constriction but it does not occur in these two conditions so what does this mean i'll explain that subsequently but essentially this is an evidence of dissociation of the intrapericardial and intraventricular pressures that we had seen in the first section of this video series because of the dissociation there is a pressure gradient between the wedge and the lv which keeps changing with the phases of respiration the gradient is very less in inspiration that is why the flow on the left side is very less in inspiration but on expiration the gradient is very high and so the flow is very high on the left side during expiration and this difference of this of the pressure gradient during inspiration and expiration is more than 5 mm of mercury and the last part is discordant lv and rv systolic pressure on respiration is there a discordancy during the various phases of respiration on the systolic pressures and it is seen in constriction but it is this it is not discordant it is in fact concordant in restrictive cardiomyopathy just like how we see it in normal people and it may be mildly discordant in acute severe rv failure but never major discordancy because which is what is seen in constriction or it can just be concordant the reason why acute severe rv failure does not display very significant discordancy is because the rv cannot distend further with further respiratory changes so with further inspiration rv cannot distend even further to lead to a further rise in rv pressures because it is already failing so this a phenomenon is a manifestation of ventricular interdependence which is again what we saw in the first part of the video series on constriction so this table serves to tell you that although there are many similarities between these three conditions there are certain points which help differentiate constriction from the other two conditions now these three points which i have highlighted in the red are not very good differentiators they can be useful for example pa pressure and the relationship between rv dp and rv s rv sp can be useful to differentiate but not always so the sensitivity and specificity of these tests is not very high to differentiate constriction from restriction and from severe rv failure but when we talk about these two points that is the left sided pressure gradient variation with respiration and the discordancy of the lv and rv systolic pressures these are very good differentiators which help differentiate constriction from the other conditions so ultimately even though we have learned so much about the diastolic pressure tracings and the differences the differentiators of constriction from the other causes is served by the systolic changes which occur that is in the form of ventricular inter interdependence causing discordant rv and lv systolic pressure which we saw in the first part of this video series to summarize the last two points which are the best differentiators of constriction from any other conditions that mimic it we have number 1 the difference in the left sided pressure gradients with phases of respiration and number 2 the discordancy in the lv and rv systolic pressures with the phases of respiration now importantly if we have to choose amongst these two the best differentiator is the discordancy in the lv and rv pressure tracings with the different phases of respiration now let's just understand the changes in the left sided pressures with respiratory phases 
I have already explained this in the first part of the video series on constriction, but just to reiterate again, on inspiration, when there is a negative intrathoracic pressure, that gets transmitted only to the pulmonary veins and the superior vena cava, and there is no transmission to the cardiac chambers. As a result, there is no such gradient from a high gradient to a low gradient. It is not established on the left side. Because there is no gradient, there is decreased blood flow on the left side. So if we have to take a pressure difference between the wedge pressure and the LV, the wedge will be negative and the LV will be relatively greater than that. Then there is decreased gradient during inspiration. On expiration, the positive intrathoracic pressure is transmitted to the pulmonary veins and the superior vena cava, but because of the thick shell, it is not transmitted to the cardiac chambers. However, now there is a good gradient which is set up between the wedge pressure and the left sided chambers being positive to negative. Now, when you have a positive to negative gradient, it ensures blood flow and so there is greater blood flow on the left side. So the wedge to LV pressure gradient is now increased in expiration and it is decreased on inspiration and the difference is more than 5 millimeters of mercury. So this variation is seen only with constriction and this occurs because there is dissociation of the intrapericardial and the intraventricular pressures because of this thick shell. The second and the most important is the systolic pressures which change with phases of respiration. Now in normal people or those who have restrictive cardiomyopathy for example, on inspiration there is a drop in the LV as well as the RV systolic pressures and we've seen this again in the first part of the video series in which there is direct transmission of the intrathoracic pressure across the normal pericardium to the ventricles. So overall the ventricular pressures both on the left side and the right side drop and on expiration both of them rise and these, this is a concordant change. So there is a concordancy which is maintained in both inspiration as well as expiration. In constrictive pericarditis, when there is inspiration, the LV pressures drop but the RV pressures rise and so you get a discordant change and opposite changes occur during expiration in which the LV pressure is higher than the RV pressure which in fact drops. Now after having learned about all the hemodynamic findings in constriction, how do you evaluate a suspected case of constrictive pericarditis on echocardiography? A jerky interventricular septum also known as a septal bounce, respiratory variation of mitral and tricuspid inflow velocities and a dilated inferior vena cava. These are the main cardinal features. You will have to watch part 3 of the video series on constrictive pericarditis. As always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon and I will see you next time with another video.